uh, where I will formally introduce Jeremy Ryan, broadcaster, and Philip Jones, BBC producer. We have a number of questions. We'll take it in turns to ask the questions. Um, we'll either say to whom it is attended to, or you know, you can stick your hand up and have a go, sort of thing. <coughs> so my first question is to you, Jeremy. Um, as you are a relatively recent convert to cycling, what got you into cycling in the first place? Well, uh, basically, I realised that when I ate donuts, I was starting to see them in the mirror. And um, I was so slim for so long without trying. And then at 45, I don't know what happened to my metabolism, but I thought I need exercise. And I tried belonging to a gym, and it cost about 500 quid a year. And I was there for one year, and I had two jacuzzis. So that didn't work. They were very expensive. So I thought I need to find a way of, of just embedding exercise in my in my daily routine. I do I do think we've got access now in 2018 to amazing dietary advice and all of that, but it's hard in London to to exercise. Um, and and I thought I would try commuting to work, Chiswick to Oxford Circus, six and a half miles. That's 13 miles a day. That's what 75 miles a week. And I started. And if I hadn't started, I, I would be 16 stone now. Um, but it gave me. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff we'll talk about about safety and, and the downside. But the upside is that if you spent the whole of your life, as I had, on tubes, in black cabs, um, on trains, particularly in a car, I've, I've got a car, I insure a car, I tax a car. When you get onto a bike, it's like you're flying. It's an amazing, freeing feeling. And I think the sadness for me is that people are stuck on the safety point and they, <coughs> they don't see beyond it. Okay, that's Wonderful, thank you. And Phil, as a cyclist of more than 30 years, what is, you must have started very young, Phil. Uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> how has it changed for the better and for the worse? I think it's, there's just far more cyclists. I mean, I first, I've been at the BBC for about 28 years, and I, when I first started cycling, and there'd be me and another rather eccentric person next to me on the Euston Road. And these days, Literally, there might be 25 people at each junction. So it, the, the main difference is I think there's just far more people cycling, which you're probably all aware of. I'd also add, I think in the early days, those cyclists were kind of free spirits, probably the type of people who we don't like, who broke the law, who went through red lights, who, uh, you know, were, were doing it because they probably were quite eccentric. These days, I think cyclists are... By and large, and we, we probably have all seen people, we hear about them jumping lights, we see them, but by and large, I'd say cyclists are much more courteous and much more law-abiding and much more safety conscious because you, on that junction I was talking about on the Euston Road, probably nearly all, everybody is wearing a helmet and everybody has a, has a fluorescent vest and, and everybody is quite law-abiding. Okay, thank you. So we turn to David. Great, thank you. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, good to see you here. Now, if I could ask you, Jeremy, I mean, we, we know you had a, a confrontation, an incident with a motorist in August 2016. Mm. Um, how did that affect you uh, as a cyclist? Well, it, it, um, just to say what happened, I was, I was cycling back from the BBC. I was cycling through Kensington. I was going down the street that goes beside the Kensington Chelsea council building, which you'll know is one way, and it's not that wide, it's got parked cars on either side. And I've been a little bit more confident, actually, about cycling in the middle, since TfL run an advertising campaign that they put on the bus stops and so on, where they said cyclists have every right, cycle out from parked cars. So I now do that, so I'm a, a car door's width from the parked cars. The driver behind me was hooting and beeping, uh, was obviously upset by my road positioning. I stopped to see what was going on she went ballistic and threatened me and kicked me and said she was going to knock me out and because she then turned out to be um on suspended sentences for other offenses she sadly ended up in jail i say sadly because i felt sort of responsible and i in a way i wish it hadn't happened um but i mean interestingly i then up because i film front and back when i'm cycling and i brought some of my kit along i can show you i mean it's like you know, there's, there's a hell of a lot of it. I shouldn't really need to wear it all, but anyway. Um, I had, therefore, you know, evidence for the police, and I had a video that I could upload. And I uploaded it, and it had about 15 million hits. And what was really interesting, I was on my Facebook page, I was just looking at it, just the comments, about 3,000 comments underneath it. 
and 1,500 blame me for the whole incident. You know, it's been through a court, we've had a judge look at it, we've had, a, we've had lawyers on it. I'm, I'm sorry to say the, the driver was to blame for it, but half the 3,000 blame me. And the, the chief complaint of the 3,000 is I shouldn't even have been there because I don't pay tax and insurance. And this comes up, all cyclists know this comes up again and again and again. Now actually, what's really interesting is, if you look at that incident, there were two of us in it, myself and the driver. Only one of us was paying tax and insurance on a car, and it wasn't her. Because I'm taxing and insuring a car back at home that I wasn't using. She turned out to have no tax or insurance. Actually, wasn't, it seemed not to be, amazingly, an issue in the case, even though when I was a teenager, my parents told me it was one of the most serious crimes to drive around uninsured. So I suppose the lesson for me, to get back to your question, David, was that I... I it's, a, it's a great shame to say this, but there are drivers who, who's who don't like cyclists and, and they're in charge of two tons of metal and they're a danger. And it's, as a cyclist, you learn not to tangle with them. And it was probably, it probably would have been better when she hooted her horn if I pulled over and let her pass because actually I was at risk, not just through her assault on me, but through the fact that she could have actually driven straight on when I stopped. So sadly, the lesson is to not get into that situation. So the public can reaction. I, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Because I feel slightly guilty about the whole incident. Because I remember in in the early days when Jeremy first started cycling, I said to him, "The one thing you've got to make sure, or one of the one things you've got to make sure, <laughs> is when you're cycling past parked cars, make sure you have enough space." Because that because I remember somebody in my street once died when a car a car door opened. He was actually on a motorbike and he went flying and he died. And that's difficult in London because the streets are so narrow and it seems to be the one thing motorists just don't quite understand because you go on the pavement, it's illegal, you're told to get off, you go on the road and it's a narrow street and, cycle, and motorists seem to think you shouldn't be there either. Now the reason I just wanted to say something because I broke my own, my own rule about a, a year and a half ago. I... I was cycling home from work and it was a sunny afternoon and the, I was too close to a car door and the car door opened and I went flying. Bus was coming the other way. Luckily I was all right. I was just badly bruised and uh, a bit shaken and uh, it wasn't very nice, but um, it happens. And, and the danger of those, I mean, just cycling here this afternoon, <laughs> it would have been interesting for you all to have seen our ride from from the BBC here, and the number of dangers that are happening all the time. I was just going to say, David, on, on the broader point, maybe this, this might be useful to the committee. Um, when I Phil has cycled for 30 years. I was always quite hostile to cyclists. So when he would come in on the show, uh, he would say, oh, I was cycling in my local park, and somebody told me it wasn't allowed. And I said, well, if it's not allowed, it's not allowed. You know. And then actually one day this thing happened and I thought I've got to get to exercise and I, became, I completely saw it then from the cyclist point of view. I think if you don't cycle you can't, can't really see this. But my foot, seven years ago when I started, my very first thought was we don't need to change the layout of the roads. We need to change the mind of the driver. That was my first thought. And I went along in quite a kind of happy clappy way thinking as long as I give the drivers a bit of love and understanding, um, gradually we'll all learn to share the roads. Sadly, I've come to the conclusion that we will never completely reduce, eliminate the number of really angry, dangerous drivers. And therefore, sadly, the answer is layout. And the Kensington incident was just underlined that, that we need a layout that means that that driver is not in the same space as me, which is tragic, actually. Was that incident in Kensington an, an isolated incident? Um, or, or have there been more incidents like that during your time well, as if, a cyclist? <laughs> if you, so I've got my cameras on my bike. I've had, I think one person has gone on a driver awareness course as a re result of something I've filmed. One person went to court, was fined £3,000 as a result of knocking me off, albeit in a slightly more passive-aggressive way because he just slid past and into me and I fell off. But... Um, so yeah, there have been. But if you were to say to me how many offences do I film every day by drivers, in 13 miles, 30, 40? I mean, if you include close passes, 
um, particularly. Yeah, and I, I rang up because when, when uh, the first thing happened and I was knocked off, and I, the, the part of this whole culture is to do with reporting and how easy it is to report. And for a while, I'm not sure how they are at the moment, but the Met had a, a they've just brought in a website where you can upload your film and they act on it, which is, which is so speedy. And uh, I, I thought I'd ring the person who then emailed me to thank her for, for the work she did. This is pre-Kensington, this is the other case. And I said, you must be, so I'm talking to this lovely person, I don't know where she is, but I said, just want to say, I really appreciate you. You, you know, you've taken action. This guy's been fined. Okay, I had to turn up in court, but it was well worth it. Um, what are you not getting snowed in with stuff? And she said, "Oh my God, you won't believe. There's one guy is posting us 20 incidents a day from his commute to act on. And uh, so, if you say how many offences are there, I could say two or three in seven years, or I could say 2,000. You know, it just depends on how you define it." I wonder if for both of you, have you ever lived in any other cities where you've had uh, a different experience to, to what you're describing in London? I know, I know personally I've lived here, I've lived in Berlin, which has got much wider roads, so there's, there's segregated cycle lanes everywhere, there's a space for pedestrians, there's a space for uh, motorised vehicles, there's a space for trams in the middle, but the roads are you know, five times as wide as they are in London. Um, so it's much easier to cycle there. Uh, I wonder, for, for both of you, have you ever had any uh, I've lived abroad, but I've, ci yeah. I've cycled abroad. I've certainly cycled in Holland. I mean, I take the point about many European cities are wider. I mean, Amsterdam isn't. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the roads around the canals are very narrow. They still manage to have cycle routes on every single street. Uh, obviously, the attitude of the Dutch is very different to the attitude of, 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 the, av of not the average, but many, many British London drivers. Um, generally speaking, Holland, Germany, Dem Scandinavian countries have brilliant cycle routes and you feel safe. I've taken my family on hot, my children and wife on holiday to uh, other countries and it's a delight, it's a pleasure to cycle. It's not something you feel you you know you're putting your life on the line. Um, then again, I would say you know I spend a bit of time in Glasgow filming. I think London is ahead of Glasgow for cycle infrastructure. I my parents live in Sutton, bless them. Um, I would feel more unsafe cycling there because people are getting up to 50 on residential streets. I think there's a lot. You know I, I do I do try to be really positive about cycling. The only way this is going to work if is if people like the reporter who interviewed me this morning, and I said to her, where do you live? And she said, Brixton. And I said, where do you cycle? No, it's too dangerous, she said. You know, unless people start to feel there's an upside, we're not going to get anywhere. We need critical mass of cyclists. So I don't want it, London is not a disgrace or a disaster. It's getting there. It's a complicated, big city. It's very hard to change it. Um, but yeah, and I've seen worse. I was in Madrid last week because it was half term, actually. I'm just trying to, I, I, my impression was that it probably wasn't as good as London, but the mind of the driver was different. That was different. And for some reason, uh, you know, we've probably all been in cars and felt that sense that you've got a machine that can do 80 miles an hour, but you can only do two. The fury that's inside those metal boxes is incredible. You don't want to lift the lid off. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make just, um, some comments, uh, pose a question about the filming and, and also the number of offences. I think there's a culture in cyclists, I'm a cyclist, I've cycled in my entire life. Um, I was also in London because I was born and bred here. But f drivers don't film cyclists, cyclists film drivers. So when you talk about the numbers of offences drivers commit, would it be the same if drivers bothered to film cyclists? <laughs> well, there are more drivers than cyclists. Um, there are clearly offences. There are bad cyclists and bad drivers. Of course, that's true. We have to watch out with false equivalence here because if you look at people killed on the pavement, not on the roads, pedestrians killed on the pavement, 108 are killed by cars, vans, etc. for every one killed by a cyclist. So, but yes, for sure. And of course, drivers do have dash cams now and we're going to a position where everybody films everything all the time, aren't we? Um, I, mean, I don't, you know, I, I think if you're driving two tons of metal and you commit a criminal offence in it, you're going to be causing a lot more damage than if you're on a bike. And I don't in any way, you know, we, we went through 12 uh, sets of lights 
on the way here. Seven were red. We stopped at all seven together. We didn't think about going over the red lights, not even on a left turn on one where there was no other cars. We didn't do it. I think it's, we could, yeah, you may want to talk about bad cyclists and the, the tro trouble they cause, but I just make the point that if you're hit by a cycle, you're going to have about 1,200 joules of energy, Sean, communicated to you. If you're hit by uh, a 4x4, four four, it's about 275,000 joules of energy. But there's no equivalent, of course, but if you're pedestrian, the, the bike still makes a significant thing. I only say that because the important thing I think you've said is about the mind of the driver. While drivers and cyclists have to share any kind of road space, the mind of the driver is going to be very important. And I think sometimes a cycle lobby, in its, its denigration of drivers, is prolonging the point at which drivers will accept cyclists as, as you know, an equal road user. That's the only reason I pose these mm. questions. And, and to be clear, I hope I haven't denigrated them today, not least because I am one. But there was a study recently where um, they, they asked the question, what, if you wear a bib and you put words on the back of it, what are the most effective words to put on? Now, somebody sent me a while back one that says, um, polite notice, uh, drive carefully. And the word polite looks like police. And it has the Metropolitan Police's strip on it. And the idea of it was that you know, it fools drivers. What I discovered when I wore it was that the 10% of drivers who aren't fooled are even more furious when they see it. I so I stopped wearing it. Um, <laughs> then. <laughs> Uh, then then this, this survey, so the survey said that doesn't work. The survey then tried some of the more mellow ones. I've seen someone drive, cycling around London with a bib that says your grandfather on the back. That doesn't work. The only thing that works, according to this research, are the words filming for police on the back of your bib. That's the only thing that buys you a little bit of extra passing space. So, yeah, it may be the mellow approach doesn't work very well. Okay, yes, I want to pick up um, the area of public attitudes around um, cycling and we know that actually over the last decade it has actually got safer um, to cycle around the capital but people don't so think it is. So what other factors apart from safety do you think that stop people cycling in London? Maybe Phil, do you want to start? I think it's as, as Jeremy as I think we've said twice already, I mean, it's the safety, isn't it? Safety, it? I mean, I think it, I, I'd love to cycle, but it's not safe. We've all heard that. And, and it's so sad. And, you know, if I was one of you, I'd, I'd want to change that. Mm. Because I, I the idea that you don't, that this, this form of transport, which, which is so cheap, efficient, green, uh, gets you there on time, doesn't injure others, is, is, is people aren't using it in, in our wonderful great city because it's not safe, I just think is very sad. I, I, I mean, I think there's a, something to do with kids here as well. I've got two daughters who are 11 and 13. Now, um, I, I can take risks. I've got my whole sort of operation of cameras and lights and every other thing in that bag. But I can't really impose the risk on them. And, and a good test for me is, um, can, you know, can I get my 13-year-old to cycle from Chiswick to Trafalgar Square on a Saturday? You know, is there, any, is there any way I can be genuinely certain she's safe? I don't mind going a long way round. I can't at the moment. You know, I can't. There's a whole CS9 thing going on in Chiswick at the moment, as you'll know. And I have, I've not really taken part in it. But I did ask, there's a particular councillor who's very, very anti it. And I did just tweet to this person saying, can you explain how my 13-year-old can cycle down the Chiswick High Road unless you build a bike path? Uh, I wish it wasn't called a superhighway, by the way. And um, she said, yes, she can cycle on the pavement. Now, I'm just trying, how does that actually work? Is that true for a start in law? Is that true? My 13-year-old could, I don't think so. I think it would cause a lot of, and then where am I when she's cycling on the pavement? Am I on a bus or something or what? You know. So it's quite a good test just, you know, could, would your 13-year-old, Cycle from, it's too dangerous, yeah, I'm sensing not. But, but, you know, risk perception is a massive thing in our society. And, of course, the one thing we don't say is that it's very, very, very dangerous to sit on a sofa eating Pringles and watching Netflix. That's the biggest, <laughs> that is the biggest danger. Or at the moment, Winter Olympics, I think. Yeah. That, no, that's Pringles probably not so dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
that, that's very interesting. I think we'll come on to some of the points you raise about children cycling and so on shortly. But um, you think safety is the main barrier, nothing else? I, I, I do I do think so. And I, I'm talking about my you know my friends around the BBC and everything else. And I say and I say, oh James, well you should cycle. It's great. He sees me in all my clubber, you know. And it's, it he just he just says, yeah, but you have a, I've seen this thing in Kensington, Jeremy. For God's sake, why would I do it? You know. And I say, well, if I get a cab from my house to my workplace at 7:30, it takes 46 minutes. If I get on a bike and do it, it takes 37. That's one great reason. And I save on the gym. And you know. And also, this is a slightly disconnected, but it's very pressing. I'm 200 yards from the A4. That thing is spraying diesel particulates, carcinogens, carbon over my children. At least I can do something small to stop it. Because in the end, the biggest thought here is that we, we are poisoning ourselves. You know, no question. In terms of um, people who do cycle, and obviously we're seeing more and more, but the majority of cyclists still are white men like yourselves. What do you think needs to change to get to more diverse people cycling? Do you know, I was aware, uh, the first time I really thought about that was when I looked at your, you know, the shape of, of your inquiry, and, I, and it, it made me think about it, and I realised I should have thought about it before. And um, I th th there may be all kinds of social factors there, but I, I just, it is not entirely cost-free to use a bike. That's probably the issue. Now I, you know, you, believe it or not, if you if you cycle a bike, you have to take it in to be serviced once a year, and it sounds like, you know, using a car, and they they charge you ninety quid because they've done your tyres and your chain needs replacing, and that, so there is a bit of a cost element to it. Um, you know, bus bus travel in our city is is very cheap per mile, um, and it may be an easier commute for people who are at, at the low paid end of the spectrum. That's my only thought on it. So the cost of it, that is a barrier. I, I mean, clearly it's not as costly as a car. No, no. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I don't really have an answer. Do you have an answer? Mm. I don't know. I mean, the cost of it is interesting because I cycled, when I was a kid, I, cycled, I, lived, I lived in Wimbledon and I cycled more than my kids. We, we lived at the top of the Archway Road in Highgate because they had free bus travel. Yeah. And maybe kids aren't picking up the habit for perfectly good reasons because they had free bus travel. So. Um, I don't know. Maybe that applies to dif different groups in, in London. I don't. I don't know. I mean, some. I mean, I. I think every parent that put their kid on a bike this morning to go to school in the rain. I mean, let's be honest. The, the weather isn't is going to stop some people as well. Also, safety at night. I worry about my wife coming back late at night from. She's a musician from from gigs and things. So. Yeah, I mean, there are, I don't, it's not, there, there are other things as well. I look a lot at the stats on, on safety, and it, it's true that the number of, if we just selfishly look at cyclist injuries, the number of, of deaths is thankfully low relative to the number of cyclists. However, that disguises the number of people seriously injured in a life-changing way who have only had their lives saved by 21st century medicine. That's the first thing to say. And secondly, there was a survey a year ago about just incidents. You know, you, did you have a commute today where at some point your safety was compromised? And, you know, in a five-mile five commute, everyone has one incident where they think, oof, I'm glad I stopped then or I turned left then or whatever, because if I hadn't, dot, dot, dot. And so actually, looking at the number of the actual figures for killed and seriously injured cyclists is maybe not where the risk perception is coming from. And even just as we cycle down here, Phil and I, I don't want to go on about it, but my goodness me, you know, Bloomsbury, was it? Or you've got, two, it used to be one lane for cars. They put a, a, a dotted line down the middle, so it's two lanes for cars. But there's nowhere for a cycle to go. So do you stay in with the traffic? Do you go down the left? Do you walk your bike down the pavement? You know, there are lots of places where you f physically feel you're not safe. Do you think one of the challenges um, for people taking up cycling is actually where they physically can store a bike, lack of secure parking, if they live in some blocks of flats and so on. And do you think these new um, dockless bikes might help meet that gap and get more people cycling? Well, I, I hope so. I, I haven't quite, I haven't ridden one yet. And I gather there's a bit of a fuss about them being, in inverted commas, abandoned. But, they, but at the same time, apparently they've got some geolocation mm, so they can they pick have, them up again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting idea. I don't know if you've seen them, but these bikes where they just basically leave them. 
But yes, certainly, if you live in a flat, um, or if you're worried about the security of your bike, keeping a bike outside 365 days a year, as I do, because I haven't got anywhere to store it, you know, that means it rusts quicker, it gets older quicker, and you, know, you might have to replace it after three or four years. Um, I, but, I, but again, with London, I mean, the amazing thing about a bike, you cycle, go to the centre of Soho, you lock it to a lamppost in two seconds, no car can park there. It's, it, it is freeing. But I think storing is a problem for people in a city where we're all challenged for space, for sure. And just finally, in terms of attitudes towards cyclists, obviously we talked about motorists earlier, and I know a few of us recently went out testing the new infrastructure and had a passenger in a taxi shouting abuse at us to move over. Yeah. Um, but you know, how, how generally have you found public attitudes perhaps have changed? and Are they more positive towards cyclists, or is it a mixed bag? To be honest, your story is totally distracting me there. You had a passenger in we a did. taxi. We did. Tell us to pull <laughs> over. <laughs> Because you, you were made the mistake of cycling in the road, yeah, presumably. and there were yeah. quite a few of us cycling we on our trip round. Really? No, we weren't. No, we no, no. Single no. Single no. To put, and it wasn't the driver; it was the passenger out the back window. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a hobby that, for some people. Yeah, that was nice. What was the question? Sorry, <laughs> but I mean that. that the attitudes so, generally. The, we um, talked about motorists, but wider now. What's the attitude to cycling? Do you see now? Perhaps Phil over the time when like, it's changed. I mean, my experience: there's a small minority of motorists who seem just as angry as ever. Um, that's my, my my experience. I mean, I wish it was different, but that's. Mm. I, I was I was just looking. I've got a, a guy here on Twitter who who logs a lot of the tweets about cyclists. Um, when I'm driving, can I? I don't know if I can read this out. It includes bad language. Um, when I'm driving and I see a cyclist, I always want to swerve into them and nudge them off, fuckers. Penny. Cyclists wonder why they get, this is Chris P on Twitter, cyclists wonder why they get knocked off their bikes. These rode all the way through the village about three abreast so no cars can pass the arrogant F word. Um, hate them, this is Tom on Twitter, Tom Harrison. Hate them cyclists that take up the whole road and act like they're remaking Tour de France. You'll be doing Tour de Hospital if you carry on. It just goes up, this is just, he just sent me this this morning because I said, can you send me some of these tweets? It is amazing how, where's this coming from? I don't understand where this hatred comes from. Emma Way tweets, definitely knocked a cyclist off his bike earlier. I have right of way. He doesn't even pay road tax. Hash tag bloody cyclists. Um, and then, I don't mean to attack a colleague, but what on earth is the Top Gear presenter, Matt LeBlanc, doing, saying um, it, he's annoyed with cyclists when there are three or four of them side by side so they can chat, but they don't move out the way. That's frustrating. Do I bump them with the car? No, but maybe I give a tap on the horn like, come on, move over. So apparently I'm not allowed to cycle in front of Matt LeBlanc either. Good grief, good grief. Well, um, we've got a long way to go <laughs> by the sound of it. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. I'll turn to Caroline again. Yes, um, I'm going to pick up on the issue of children. Um, and uh, we've got a mayor who said during the mayoral election campaign that he was very worried um, about allowing his daughters to cycle in London because he was worried about safety. So hopefully that's um, going to get him really working on actually making it safer. Um, but um, you've said, Jeremy, already that you're concerned about your kids cycling on the road, um, getting them from Chiswick to Trafalgar Square. What do you think would actually make you feel confident about your children making everyday journeys on their bike? I think one of the great things that's happened in the last few years is that, is that segregated lane on embankment. So we can all see at the absolute, if, if we want to get somewhere good, that's where we want to get. And I've seen pictures tweeted of, of very small children on that, which, you know, unthinkable years ago. Now, I know... Cab drivers and others were furious when it was all going. These things do cause ructions when they're built. But now, I was looking at the figures, apparently it takes up one lane of a four-lane road and carries more traffic in rush hour than the other three lanes put together. That's the dream. Is it not to have that on every road, but just to have it in a place where I can get from Chiswick, I can get to it, and then I can go down it and end up at Trafalgar Square. That's all. So if we had a north-south and an east-west, that would be lovely. Um, uh, but I'll put up with anything that, that takes me out of danger in areas of real hazard. Now, Hammersmith Broadway is an example. 
Uh, I think several years ago, there was a vote consultation. It was all decided it's going to change. Nothing's happened. I had to. I engage with it every day. I go across it. It is like going into the seventh circle of hell as a cyclist. You know, you just hope you come out the other side, but you're not sure. And I'm just. I'm waiting and waiting for something to happen there. So that's the block slightly. Um, Kensington High Street is problematic as well, particularly if you've got kids. I don't. I'm not asking for the world. Just one one route. You know, there are so many roads that don't have cycle tracks. Could we just have one? That's all. Just one. Direction. Yeah, well, you know, we could cycle both ways down the one. It's half a one would be okay. Phil, do you have any experience of children and cycling? My, my children are 22 and 25, and my, my son's 22. He cycles in London, and I worry. I worry a lot because, it, it, because as we're saying, it's, it's dangerous. I, I, in terms of encouraging families to cycle, I mean, I, I'm not sh sure why we don't use our imagination a bit more and why don't we close more roads on a Sunday and allow families to cycle through the centre of London mm -hmm. than they seem to do, be able to do that in Paris, which is another huge city clogged with vehicles most of the time. Uh, I think that would be a great idea. I'm not sure. I've, I've had the only other accident I've had on my bike was on was in Regent's Park on the Outer Ring. I'm not sure why cars are allowed to drive there because they all seem to be half of them seem to be breaking the speed limit. It seems again a great opportunity, a great part of London where there's no need to have cars. Uh, particularly ones that are knocking that knock knock me down. Luckily, I wasn't injured, but it broke my bike off. Again, why, it would be a lovely place for us to take children to, to, so they, they get in the habit of being able to cycle in London. We live in a very green city. There's lots of parks. I'm not sure why it's such a battle to have cycle routes in, in some of our, in more of our green, green places. I might be wrong about this, but I, I, I cycled across is it Queen Elizabeth Park, the old um, Olympic space, there didn't seem to be any restrictions on cycling. It may have changed, but there didn't seem to be any restrictions on cycling in that part. And I thought, how wonderful. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but that's what I noticed as it changed. Yeah, well, there's, there's some bits of the Olympic Park that are really dire from a cycling point of view. You can't, uh, yeah, the fact that they've done it built from scratch and haven't made it easier to cycle there. There's the school run time. Mm. It's, there's an awful lot of vehicles yeah. dropping people, children in cars sure. rather than arriving by and bike. And it ought to be possible in places like that and Old Oak Common to actually design in cycling from, from the very beginning. In a really I'm, a, I'm a driver. We know what it's like when there's bad cyclists. I'm also a pedestrian. I know what it's like when sometimes cyclists are, are Abuse, abuse things and um, but generally I, I fail to see why more of our parks can't have cycle routes but blessed with a wonderful green city I've been I've just uh, while we're on parks I mean I do cycle every day through Hyde Park and it's really fascinating I, I don't know I'd love to meet the people who run Hyde Park so they've they've worked out that the park is being used as part of I don't know if it's a super highway technically but certainly it's a cycle path for people who go from the bottom left hand corner to the top right which is Marble Arch and at some point they got upset because a cyclist was clocked doing 32 miles an hour so they they reacted with horror and they put speed bumps all the way through it and my bike is a bit rickety so now I'm going like that through Hyde Park um, at the same time you know you've got You've got cars going up the middle, but you've got also that wonderful segregated lane up the middle of Hyde Park. Was it South, it's not South Carriage Drivers? What is the name of that? The one that slices right through the park. That's a really, really great bit of cycle infrastructure. So I just, I never know what to say about Hyde Park. What, what's going on in Kensington Gardens? You know, why close a path for two months to put in speed bumps? They then, I think, had so many complaints, they had to close it again, take them out and replace them. Um, because it's, it's speed bumps are bad for people with disabilities as well. Well, they're bad for, and they're bad for families. Them. You know, I now have a thought that I, and it's just gone into my subconscious really, that Hyde Park is hostile to cyclists and that it's better not to cycle there. And um, they're certainly very friendly to cars. They seem to be very friendly to that abomination that is Winter Wonderland that comes in every year. And I don't know who's given that permission. But as for cyclists, they have a real problem with them, you know. 
I'm going to um, move us on to um, something else. When um, the Assembly announced that you were coming to um, talk to us, um, there were a lot of um, uh, tweets about uh, helmet wearing. Um, now, I have to confess here, I ride to City Hall every day. I cycle in ordinary everyday clothes and I don't wear a helmet. Um, and, um, but there were several people expressing in a, vi a view that helmet wearing should be compulsory. Are you, um, what, what, what is your response to that? Oh, it would be utterly disastrous for cycling in London if helmet wearing was compulsory, because it would mean that if you can't find your helmet, you can't cycle. Uh, you then get in a car, uh, with what consequences, I don't know. We know clearly that the majority, more head injuries are um, caused to people inside cars than on bicycles. So if you're going to have compulsory helmet wearing for cyclists, you have to have compulsory helmet wearing for car passengers as well. In and fact, cyclists. somebody on Twitter has discovered that, there are, that predominantly head injuries are caused um, by people who've been drinking beer, and therefore there should be a law saying if you drink beer, you need to wear a helmet, etc. So, um, to get, and in fact, the, I think the Twitter account is, is called something like helmet for, Helmets for Beer Drinkers. So, um, I, I just in all seriousness, I think, <laughs> I just think, um, we, where possible, let's take the freeing option. And to say I can't find my helmet, so I can't cycle, and then well, how are you going to enforce it? Aren't the police busy enough without you know, stopping cyclists for not wearing helmets. So I think, yeah, you, you, it's interesting. You, I normally wear, here, look, here's my helmet here. So I wear this most of the time. For some reason, the photo you very kindly tweeted didn't have it, so I got a day of trolling, but I don't mind that. Um, but, and all the people say, uh, well, they mostly say you shouldn't be on the roads because you don't pay tax. Uh, for, for, and I then respond, oh, I have got a car, so I do. Um, and I'm zero emission. But those who said the helmet thing, I just... You know, I think need to be, often they've got very good intentions. Often people have, you know, know somebody in their family who's had a head injury and they're very serious about stopping head injuries. And I respect that completely. I'm just not sure that, that wearing this on my head is actually going to help me if I'm hit by a truck. That's the crucial thing. I think it's going to be up to the individual. I mean, if you, I don't completely know the statistics, but if you look at Holland again, which maybe some of us aspire to, uh, towards um, very few people wear a helmet there. 70% of people in Holland cycle and very few of them wear a, wear a helmet and they don't have any more accidents than we have, probably less. I mean, well, there's huge, huge numbers of children cycling to school. Children are cycling. And you said you cycle in your normal clothes. Businessmen will get on their bikes with their cases and cycle. Oh, little old ladies, little old gentlemen will cycle on their bikes and... Uh, they don't wear helmets. The, I'm the not obsession, sure why, but they don't. The the sort of obsession if you cycle is with a, a lot of it is with the space that cars give you as they pass. It's very intimidating when cars come really close. Some, I think, a minority do it because they just don't like cyclists being on the road, so they want to just worry you, you know, in the way that uh, a dog worries sheep. And um, there was a survey done uh, in I think Portsmouth where he, he, the, the, the guy who did it found a way of measuring the passing distance when he was out on his bike. And he discovered that the more dressed he was to cycle, the, the less passing distance he was given. Mm. And he concluded that it was safer to wear a wig than a helmet. So if, if he sat up and dressed um, as, actually, this is what the study said, a female cyclist with a wig and a basket on the front, and sort of moving like that, cars would go a long way round. Once he puts a helmet on, and he puts lycra on, they pass him really, really close. So it, it may be counterproductive. I'm not, I haven't worn a wig while cycling, but I wouldn't, it would be silly. That was, that was Ian Walker's research. Yes, yeah, so you know yeah, about those, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, yeah. and, you know, absolutely is one of the reasons why, you know, I take the decision I take to cycle in ordinary clothes and not put a helmet on. Mm. So you feel I safer. Look like 55 year old woman on a set up and beg mm. bike making my way, uh, you know, making my way to work each day. And, um, and actually I, I don't have as many close passes as I used to have when I cycled on a drop handlebar bike that I'd had since 1986. I've recently swapped oh, to a different kind of riding position. And I, you know, I've noticed people, you know, you, 
you, you also feel more mellow when you're upright, and yeah. uh, it's just I'm having a less aggressive experience, but you know, that's really, anecdotal. Really but um, then finally, um, what cyclists look like? I mean, I think you know, we discussed a bit earlier the kind of the different attitudes to people who are riding bikes and the idea that it seems to be, you know, the numbers of people who are cycling who are male and white mm. and wearing lycra um, are, you know, sort of very, very numerous. And the people who are just wearing ordinary clothes and, you know, cycling their kids to school are quite few and far between <laughs> in London. And you've mentioned Holland, um, where it just... It's the obvious, you know, cycling is the kind of default way that people get around. Um, certainly whenever I've done surveys with children at school, their ultimate, you know, they all want to either scoot or cycle to school. That's what children put their hands up most and, and that's how they'd like to get there. So how do, you think we can, how, how do you think we can sort of get to that point where people, rather than seeing cyclists as a thing, actually see people cycling. Um, do, you, do you see the difference between cyclists and people cycling? I, and yeah, I, th I think part of it probably is going po sort of the post-helmet thing model that you're describing in your own life, and I'm, I'm, I'm a step behind you with that. I think, I, think uh, I was at some traffic lights recently, and I was in a cab, and there were, there were eight cyclists in the, in the cycle box ahead of the driver, and he said, look at that, and I can't see it getting any better. And uh, I, thought, <laughs> I thought, actually, those eight, once the eight become 16, once you get critical mass, I think there will be a sudden cultural change. And we're already at a point where if you're driving a car around London, you'll all know that you, ha you are pretty conscious that you've probably got a cyclist just there or just there. You, you, you know when you turn left, you, you, unless you look, you're in danger of hitting someone. Now, a lot of people find that very, very unsettling. But imagine if there were two or three times as many, the extra caution that the drivers would use. That's, 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 I think, firstly, critical mass in terms of numbers. And secondly, obviously, we've talked about layout. And, and it would be nice if, on the route to school, there was a way that was safe. You know? I, think, I think it is difficult for a main road where people want to go at 40 ever to be truly safe for cyclists. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry, Sean, you wanted to come in. I just, I just want to ask about this question of, of helmets. E e Walker study sounds quite, um, quite interesting, and, it, and it, as a driver, I, I can see this sense in that. But, um, but surely, if you want to get cycling to epidemic numbers, huge numbers of people, surely helmets would be necessary, if only because of the impact they then have on the, on the emergency services, because more cyclists at some point, they're going to be more in head injuries which tend to be serious by their nature. Yeah, yeah. gosh, I, I need to get you out on the road, Sean, because I feel that, that the, the impact on the emergency services or on the NHS is through obesity. That is the big... But that's help. fine, but what okay. I'm suggesting is, but we're talking about cycling. It's like yeah. I cycle all the time and have always cycled. I always wear my helmet. So to the point where yeah. if I can't find it, I would not ride the bike. Okay. I certainly won't put my child on a bike without a helmet. You, uh, forget a car, you might just fall off all on your own. I, I find it quite hard to talk about cycling and not ask people, or not at least heavily suggest that they sure, wear but, helmets. But why don't you wear a helmet in when you're in a car then? Because it's just much more unlikely. You, you no, say the numbers not. are higher, but hold on, is, it, is that per capita or as an absolute figure? More likely to have a serious head injury as a passenger in a car than you are as a cyclist. Okay, yeah. but look what we're doing with cars. We're trying to protect people's heads with airbags. They're all over Still. the place. That, that's what people are asking. I said Caroline probably knows these figures better than me, but I mean, it, it just if we wake it into a stats thing where we say, look, um, there is a risk of head injury on a bicycle, therefore wear a helmet, and therefore that's the logic. We, we do need to be able to apply that logic elsewhere. And it falls apart quite quickly. And the other key so thing is that if you, if you compel helmet use, you end up with less cycling. That's happened in Australia. Mm. And the result of less cycling is other health problems later on. That's all. And, and let's talk about cycling, more cyclists, because this interests me as well. Because <laughs> at no point has anybody said, is anybody interested in cycling? All of my friends, again, I've cycled all my life, I used to race BMX bikes, I love bikes, none of them are, are interested in cycling. And the community I come from, somewhere between <clears throat> a lack of confidence, we've talked about the sort of dangers of cycling, 
but they they're also not interested in cycling. Do we think we're going to change that? That how by by you're talking about infrastructure changes. Will that be the thing that tips tips? Yeah, we're balance? going to cover infrastructure later. So, so. okay. I I uh, I mean, if you. The cyclists, I see cycling in London, nearly all of them are wearing a helmet. I, I don't see it as an issue. And Sean, you're a, you, you come on our show, you're, you're a conservative, you believe in freedom of choice. I mean, surely it's going to be up for the individual to decide. And you can't legislate to make everybody wear a helmet. But I don't think it's an issue in London. Most people are wearing helmets. Mm. Yeah. I, I just asked a question, because if you're trying to encourage, I am most, this the only part of this debate that really interests me is how do you get people who don't normally cycle to cycle. And I think seeing people, what they perceive, you know, people wheeling up and down the road or people with bright helmets and high vis on, I think that has a profound effect on if they'll ever bother to cycle. I think making them wear a helmet is, is forcing it would, would just lead to less cyclists. Okay, all right, I think we covered that one. Thank you very much. Um, Navin. Yeah, uh, <coughs> uh, after that, uh, you, you'd love this, I think. Uh, it is about those dreadful uh, politicians. Uh, it is about political attitudes. Okay, so a couple of questions on that. Uh, uh, do you think uh, that uh, political leaders are reluctant to invest in cycling? If so, why? I, I wish, obviously, I'm a little bit conscious of politics and the local elections and all of that, so I'm, I'm going to be a little bit careful on parties. But I was thinking when I came here that um, we, we have got this CS9 issue in Chiswick, and what's happened is that the, the plans have been sort of dumped on Chiswick and then everyone's been forced to fight over them and it's a pretty unedifying site. And the idea is that we get to some sort of consensus where everyone agrees a cycle route and they then build it. That's never, ever going to happen. There was a church in Chiswick where they've actually been praying that it's going to be scrapped. So my thought is, in answer to your question, that where you don't have consensus, you have to lead. And that is the role of politicians. Now, I haven't looked closely into the whole Boris Johnson final two years, but they seem to suddenly think, oh my goodness, we haven't done what we want to do, and they just suddenly rushed it through. And some of those schemes, Walthamstow apparently is absolutely brilliant, embankment I've mentioned. And, and they, you know, by, by just saying, oh, that's it, we're doing it. The one in Hyde Park, they worked. So I, I think one of the problems for, for you as a group, collectively as politicians, in, and this goes for people who lead the police and the NHS and the BBC, is that we are in the era of hyper-accountability. So every single thing you say and every single thing you do comes back at you on Twitter, distorted, <laughs> loaded, twisted. And, and therefore, your natural instinct is to say, all right, what do we all think? And the answer is, we all think different things. And that's why we need you to say, we're building this. We're going to do it. So funnily enough, I think more than ever, we need political leadership on this. Uh, now, yeah, it, the, the question was about a broad sense of, you know, political will, you know, uh, issue about uh, political courage, because there always will be very vociferous uh, minority. Question is, if you believe in uh, the cause, in this case, uh, promoting, encouraging cycling and providing uh, the right uh, level of resources and infrastructure. So this is where, you know, uh, the, the question was that, you know, what justification if, if there is any reluctance uh, in, in political leadership that is about cycling and uh, what, what uh, can be done? How can you change that culture, as you put it? I, I, I sort of st would stick with, with the, the first card I dealt there, which is just to say I, th I think that in the modern era, politicians look for consensus and here there isn't one and therefore it needs somebody to say, look, we're doing this. Now, in answer to your question, are they saying that? Um, they may be, oh, here I go all BBC on you, don't I? Um, are they saying it or are they doing it? You know, I, I, listen, look, as a cyclist, and only as a cyclist, I, I cycle around and I'm, and I'm looking for changes that are positive, and at the moment I'm a bit baffled as to why so many things seem to have been stalled. And I honestly don't know the reason. So you can tell me. Let, let me put it to you both, you know, as a cycling enthusiast, uh, how can you encourage those politicians uh, to prioritise cycling? The, the whole, we, this, this world is moving away from carbon. You know, I mean, there's absolutely no question about it. You don't have to be sort of hippie uh, type to realise that we cannot go on 
with the ownership of cars and the, the pollutants and so on, and this city just heaving with diesel. We can't do it. So it's, it's irresistible, that. Totally irresistible. Um, you know, I, and the danger, what's the biggest single danger to my kids, aged 11 and 13? What's the, is it a, you know, the newspapers would have me believe it's, it's pedophiles. Actually, it's being hit by a car. That's the biggest single danger. Um, so I think that all of that is going to actually permeate through politics. I can't see it'll go slow or it'll go fast, um, but it will happen. It will happen. Do, do, do you reckon that uh, leaving aside uh, the, 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 the political uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, whatever preferences that, that uh, London at political leadership level had uh, the right amount of uh, will to, to promote cycling? I think, should should get right direction. I think this is one for Phil. The hospital pass. <laughs> Has London got the I mean, political I mean, will to well promote cycling? It, Jeremy, I mean, the, you're the politicians. You're the people who should decide what's the right thing to do and, and, and make that lead. I mean, I, I don't... We, we, we work on a radio programme. We, we decide what goes on the show. We don't, we don't leave it to the, 11, the 7 million listeners to decide because, generally speaking, people just choose what they got they don't see the future they don't have a vision they don't realize that you can move from uh, from where you are now to a better future um, and I think that's what polit you know I, I don't want to get party political but I think that's what politicians are there to do and to dare to do it I think there are more people out there in London who not just cyclists but people who would like to cycle families, millions of people in London who would like, poli who, if politicians took a lead and dared to just leap forward somewhat, then I, th I think you'd be surprised at the better future you would build. I, I tell you what I'll, I'll, I'll say on this, because I don't want to, I don't want to sort of avoid your question. I, I did write down what Sadiq Khan said. He said he was going to accelerate the progress we've made on cycling in London over the last few years. He said he'd tripled to 36 miles the extent of segregated lanes completed under Boris Johnson and would spend a record £154 million a year over the next five years. Unprecedented focus on walking and cycling. I don't know. The most I could say to you is I don't, I don't know whether that's happened. I don't know. I look around and I'm not sure it has, but maybe it has and I haven't seen it. Sorry to be BBC on that. No. <laughs> no, impartial. Yeah, Yes. Yeah. Uh, Joanne. I want to come on to something you've touched on before about the responsibility that cyclists have to other road users. And just over a year ago, we had the appalling case of Kim Briggs, who was killed um, by a young man who was driving an illegal track bike on the road, which, which had, had no place um, um, being there. But as a, as a result of that case, the government's holding a review to see whether perhaps some of the driving legislation should be applied to cyclists or what more could be done. Um, do you think that's the right approach or what would you hope to see out of any review that can be... I'm trying to remember the exact crime that he was found guilty of, but it had a very arcane... What it was, was the it? 1861 Offence Against the Person Act for wanton and furious driving. Furious cycling. Um, I've interviewed her husband, her widower, um, it's a terrible case. The, the cyclists behave in a disgraceful way. To not have brakes and to be mixing it in a city like this at high speed with people who, you know, pedestrians could sometimes walk onto the road without you necessarily being able to, well, if you haven't got brakes, you can't stop. So I think it was a terrible thing. Um, you know, whether the law changes or not, the law obviously was sufficient to prosecute that man. Um, I don't know. I almost don't want to. I, I don't want to cut across what her husband has said. You know, I think it was a terrible case. Any comments about responsibility of cyclists in general? Yeah. Well, I, look, absolutely. Let me, let me say it really clearly. Um, cyclists have, have got to obey the law. They. I, I, I know what happens. I think they get. Some of them get into a kind of battlefield mentality because they're in a zone where they feel they are personally under threat. So they get very tense and, and hyper. Uh, they then go through a red light or they go on a pavement where they, they mustn't do it. One of the, it is one of the, and I think this was sort of touched on earlier in a way um, from, from questions about, um, Caroline, about the sort of character of cyclists. 
I mean, I think if, because we've called these things cycle superhighways, we now have an image that a cyclist is 25-year-old white male wearing lycra, lycra going at 30 miles an hour through Hyde Park and everywhere else. And this is, in, in Chiswick, this has caused a lot of problems because, because people in the road I'm in, which will abut this superhighway if it's ever built, actually fear that more than they fear vans and buses. They're actually saying they won't be able to leave the road and stuff like that. So I think the, the there's a front... I don't want to criticise... You know, if you wear Lycra, that's fine. But there is a front end of cycling which, which doesn't, present, doesn't present very well. Um, and I, and I, you know, I wish it were not the case. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, I've said, I, I need to keep saying it. There are bad cyclists and there are bad motorists. Um, and it's unfortunate. I spoke to friends and colleagues before I came here, si people, friends and colleagues who cycle, and this might surprise you. I said, what sort of things do you think we should be saying? What sort of things should we be talking about? And nobody hates bad cyclists or inconsiderate cyclists or cyclists who are breaking the law more than other cyclists. And I think that, that that was the overwhelming response that that uh, the police... I mean, I, I'm not even sure whether I agree. The police have so much to do asking the police to convict more cyclists. I don't know whether I'm gonna, I should be saying that. But that was the overwhelming response from other, other cyclists. The idea that there's just hordes of people out there who, <laughs> who take pleasure in breaking the law, going through red light, cycling on the pavement, is just not true. There's a... Like with everything else, it's a very small minority, and that sh shouldn't be stopping us doing what's right for London. And if I could just, I just want to make clear, when I said it's unfortunate, I'm, I'm referring to the general picture, so I want to make it clear for the record that the Alliston case was really a disgusting one and, and terrible. Yeah. Um, my second question then is, uh, we, we've talked a lot today about how we've changed the attitudes of the public and drivers towards um, cyclists. And, you're both in the media. Do you think the media has a, a role to play in this? And perhaps do they at times concentrate on um, the bad things to do with cycling as opposed to the, the benefits? And I hope you're not going to say BBC impartiality. No, 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 no. Sorry, I'll only, do that, like, I'll only do that line once, I promise. Um, I, do you know, that's a brilliant question because actually, although I never disagree with my editor, um, when Phil said that, you know, we decide what's in the show and the listeners listen to it. Actually, you, you will yeah, accept course, yeah, yeah. that in a, in a strange way, it's the other way around. They then, they then take it over, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we sort of think we know what's on the show. Then we say, True. you tell us, and, the, yeah, and the, sure. then we're swamped by them. And um, I, it's very difficult to characterise Radio 2 listeners as a bunch, but certainly, let's just put it like this, they drive a lot. And, you know, I was amazed when we did an item on so-called lollipop ladies, I know they call something else now, that... They were furious about them uh, taking up space, slowing them down. Um, they, the, the two particular topics that seem to drive people crazy are cycling and angling, strangely. Um, in fact, the worst one we ever did was a cyclist who'd driven over an angler's rods because um, both came together. But, 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 but there is, I think this might be an outside London thing. We've got to, I think, realise that this city is, is so different from so many other parts of the country because there are lots of places where there isn't even a thought about cyclists. Uh, if you live in Devon and you've got three people abreast in front of you on a country lane for five miles, you're probably going to ring my show the following Monday. Um, so I, I'm always conscious of listening out. I hear that voice that's not our voice here. It's a different voice. It's the voice of the person who's not cycling because it's impractical to cycle. They've got to carry stuff. They've got to take their kids around. They've got to drive, etc. Um, so that, that's a cor useful corrective for me. You know, and I, I, and, I, and, I right, yeah. and I and I wouldn't dream of, of using my show to sort of put out any sort of pro cycling message. Believe me, the listeners would be onto it so fast they would, really wouldn't accept it at all. I have to be just totally balanced on cycling more than anything else because people know I cycle. You know, and um, I, th I think I mean London is not like the rest. Of the, I mean, the Jeremy Vine show is very not London much of the time. We all, almost feel guilty when we do London stories. <laughs> But um, when I talk about lots of people in London welcoming a more positive approach to cycling, you have a city here where nearly 85% of people don't use cars to get to work. Whereas in the, I think in the rest of the UK, you can flip that statistic the other way around. So you really do have a lot of people who 
obviously use buses, trains and tube, but also bikes to, to get around. And that's a huge opportunity. And that I think that shows that there is a consensus to crack on in my unbiased BBC way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so if we're just talking about London, do you think there is more that the media could do to present a, a, either a balanced picture or actually to push the benefits of cycling more that they're not doing at the moment? The, uh, there was a piece in the Daily Mail recently where they, they took a number of pictures of empty cycle lanes and called for them all to be closed down. We get them tweeted to us regularly. Yeah, and then someone, <laughs> someone then takes a picture of the M1 empty and says uh, that should be closed as well. Um, <laughs> so, I don't, do you know what? The reason I'm pausing, it's nothing to do with BBC impartiality, is that, that it's that journalists don't really control the agenda in, in that way. In that quite in that way it, it, it's sort of there's a news has its own energy now one of the things that happens with news is that there's it's a disruption of the norm so the norm is that cyclists get and pedestrians get killed by cars and the underreporting of that is astonishing when it happens the other way when a pedestrian walks into a car and the driver dies <coughs> it's the biggest story in the country even though it's only happened once so um, that, I don't think we can do anything about that. That's the way our minds work. I don't think, you know, some clearly, I, I think you know, there was a newspaper that a few years ago did a campaign called Cities Safe for Cycling. And now I look at them and they've just gone pro-motorist. And it may be that being pro, very pro-motorist works in the same way that with my show, um, you know, if, I was, if our show was to take an editorial line based purely on aligning ourselves with our perception of our audience, we'd be pro-car, you know, because that's where the audience is right now. So if you're running a commercial operation like a newspaper, you align yourself with your readers. Um, not much can be done about that. I hope, I suppose in the end, we hope that a you know, large aggregate of personal experiences of cycling that are good, that are not about hostile streets, but, you know, friendly streets, safe streets, um, that that comes together and affects change you know, through nudge. Please. Thank you. Sure. Um, what do you say to, mo um, to motorists who say the cycle infrastructure is taking up too much road space? Well, we, we ha I think we have to go back to the, nu the, the amount of cycle infrastructure there is. And I think there's only segregated cycle space on between 2 and 3% of London's roads. So that, that's the figure I've seen. I'm, I'm open to be corrected. But if that is the case... They must be wrong. But I think what, um, what, what happened um, when, when Boris did that whole thing at the end of his tenure where he put in a lot of stuff, there, was, there were suddenly roadworks everywhere. Um, Bayswater, you'll all know, Bayswater was uh, you know, horrendous and so on. Um, and I, I had a few experiences where people were just furious. You know? And you may have a a day where you miss a job interview because there's a road work somewhere building a cycle lane, and that's very, very bad. And I suppose you, we've got to look at this as a 50-year thing, right? So the, the road works take a year and a half, and then you've got the other 48 and a half years to enjoy the effect. I don't think you can argue there's too much segregated cycle space in London. I really don't. Would you say, just address these to Phil first, would you say that some of the other benefits of cycling should be presented to road users who feel that there's too much space given to given over to cycling? Well, sure, but I, I mean, I, I, I have been cycling a long time, and I, 30, 40 years ago, I used to be bemused when there was a cycle route constructed, and it would always end at the junction, at the dangerous spot. And now I just think it's still happening. Where they've, I don't know how much they, I come down Archway in the morning and I don't know how much they spent on that junction, but it must have been millions. And I think it's largely to help buses, good thing. But again, the cycle route ends just as you hit the junction. And I just think in the 21st century, why are we doing that? And to answer your question, of course we should be telling motorists the, the benefits of cycling. And if, if, if roads are going to be cl closed temporarily to put more cycle routes in, then we, we need to be educating motorists that that's good, that's good for the environment, that's ultimately good for, for everyone. I'm a motorist as well. How much do you think the debate around quiet ways, cycle superhighways, I mean, Chiswick is a point in case, people are 
up in arms in one sense and some other people want it to happen. How, how balanced do you think the debate is? Because all of our talk about cycling has always been, you know, it's hugely beneficial, we have to have it. But there seems to be a big resistance. What are we doing to break that resistance down? We talked a lot about changing perspectives. We talked a lot about some people being angry. We talk, talked a lot about how do you change the culture. I think it's a deeply embedded thing and some people are going to be unhappy if you lot um, take a lead and, and try to do things differently. So I, I, I think that, that's what's happened. You take power, you change the perspective, you change the, you, you change the, the rules of the road, but you, you, you take road away from one lot of road users and give it to another, then the people who are losing out are gonna, are gonna be angry about it. I, I don't really see how you're gonna change that. I think, I think, you, I think where, where you will help people is if you offer a narrative. And it's the, the measurements I've seen show that pollution has dropped on embankment, for example, for, since, since the cycle, the segregated lane came in. You can fit a hell of a lot of cyclists I into the space that one person in a car takes. Um, secondly, you know, I think the pollution narrative, the carbon narrative is the key, is the key one. We just can't go on expanding, trying to fit more people into this city, all of them in cars. But, you know, people, when the, 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 the Bayswater cycle route was being um, put up and constructed, there was a tweet from a cab account which said uh, there needs to be a total moratorium on the building of cycle routes until pollution levels have dropped. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I, can't, I don't even know how you, how you can debate that because all of these things are going to involve a bit of pain, I guess, and that's where we need communication from you all. Do, do you ever see London becoming completely cycle friendly? Because, like, for instance, when we compare it to to to, um, to to Amsterdam and all those kind of places, much bigger city, greater distances to ride, completely different culture. Do you think we'll ever get there? Do you know there are places? Oh, sorry. Oh, just briefly, there there are places where I, I'm just the, the the segregated ways around Hyde Park that are absolutely tremendous. I, there are certain key tells that we're not there. I'll give you an example. Anyone been to Seven Dials recently? That little lovely roundabout. And it's got, isn't it Matilda? It's got on nearby and stuff. Why are cars allowed there? I don't understand. What's that? that. What is that about? It's the tiniest roundabout. It's a beautiful cobbled area where tourists should be able to walk on the street. And I'm thinking, every time I go there, I think, nah, we're not there yet. Can I just say, I've accidentally asked my colleagues so questions, right, sure. and, and I, I feel like they, they all right. want to go. Well, <laughs> can, can, I, can I just say this then? Do we de need to be more... Because I, 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 we all get these letters, you know, they, they're ruining our area with a cycle highway, then, then, the, then the cycle lobby will, will abuse me on Twitter for explaining that other people aren't happy about this. Do we need to be more upfront about the fact that this is about removal of cars? rather than just <laughs> put, put, putting cycles in. It's, 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 balanced debate. it's about, I guess it's going to have to be in the end about crimping car space, that's true, and then you end up with fewer cars and less pollution. But you don't end up with slower journeys, you end up with fewer people doing fewer journeys, hopefully just as quickly. Um, yeah, I think, I think you probably do, yeah, you do. Tom. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, so finally, the last question is really about um, how, how we assess the Mayor's performance. How do you think um, we should judge Sadiq Khan as to whether or not he's been successful in promoting cycling in London at the end of his mayoral term? Um, Phil. <laughs> is it just about numbers? Nice can we do it on numbers? I don't know. Can we let's just think of some... Sorry. Sorry. I, no, I was going to say... Surely there can be some metrics on this that, that the mayor has promised to spend a certain amount and you've asked whether he'd done it. There's a whole load of um, projects that have been promised, shelved, changed, speeded up, whatever. We'll know, won't we? We've got, we, we know what was on the drawing board um, and we'll see. And do you think we should also judge him on the, the demographics as well of the people? That, if, if it's just, you know, the sort of you know, white white sort of middle class men as it, as it is now, should we also be judging on, on whether more women and people from ethnic minority backgrounds? For sure, yes. 
And I think I'd go back to what Caroline said about families. I, I do think families and children are a really good test of this. You know, you can see if somewhere is safe, it's got kids on it. You know, that's, that's the, one of the key things. But yes, of course you should. I think if it's only done by people wearing the sort of gear that looks like they're on a US Navy SEAL on his way to kill bin Laden, that's not very good. Um, ideally, we wouldn't have to wear helmets at all. Okay, thank you. Could I just um, finally ask you, um, obviously, Phil, you've said you've, you've cycled around the continent um, and things. Are there any things that you've seen over there that you think we should be introducing here, whether it's infrastructure or whether Talking it's... Talking about the mayor, I, I don't... I'm just cyclists to cycle one second. Why are we the only city in London that hasn't pedestrianised the centre? I mean, sorry, the only city in Europe where we haven't pedestrianised. And then we see a move to that pedestrianise Oxford Street and there's no place for a cycle route through Oxford Street. I don't understand. Sometimes I, I just think we, we don't seem to always be moving one step forward, two steps back sometimes. I don't quite understand, and you lot will understand it more than I do, but I don't really understand why, a, why you can remove cars from Oxford Street and bike, bicycles have to go as well. Why? I just... As I say, maybe more intelligent people can explain that to me. No, I think we've raised some questions on that in our, um, in our consultation response. But no, I just wanted to know whether there's anything, whether it's through your programme or through your cycling around the continent, whether you've seen anything in other countries you think we should be looking at. Because in some ways, we are just starting the journey like in the 70s they did in the Netherlands and places, our journey on cycling. So is there anything over there that you think we should be adopting or schemes not just infrastructure, I think Dutch Reach it's called, where people, um, you use the opposite arm to open your car door so you automatically look round. Are there things, simple things it, like that that you've picked up that we should be looking to adopt in this country? It's a great, the Dutch Reach is a great idea. I mean, it's hard. We, we had a chat about what we were going to talk about and one of the, before we came here, and one of the, one of the is just how do you change culture? And we both decided, well, we can't do that. We, we can't change the culture. And I, I really think, you know, clearly it would be lovely if every, if every London driver behaved like a, a Dutch driver and, and pulled out mm. and gave cyclists a, a decent amount of space. But we can't change that. I think we can change things or if by, by actually building more cycle routes in London and making it safer for people, families and children and everybody, black, white, everyone who lives in London so they, they can cycle. No one should have to say, I don't cycle in London because it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether, you, you now have um, thousands of cyclists moving around London and they have cameras and I, and that's, potentially very helpful in terms of safety enforcement on the roads. It's still not really very easy to upload films of what you see, but I think it should be easier, and I think there should be more of an interest in dangerous driving that affects cyclists, close passes and so on. Um, sorry, that enforcement doesn't really sound like it should be the answer, but you know, the two-pronged thing, the mind of the driver and the layout is, my, is where I'm at. And I've, I've sadly decided that the mind of the driver, some drivers won't change, and therefore the answer is layout. How many of you went on this cycle trip the other week? Three of us, wasn't it? Yeah. And what, how many of you were surprised? I mean, how many of you don't normally cycle and were shocked by what you saw, or, or just from a different perspective? Are we interviewing yes, yeah. occasional <laughs> cyclists. No, it was, it was in, for us, it was seeing what the new infrastructure was like, mm. wasn't it? And actually, going on an old superhighway, going up towards Southwark Bridge was quite frankly frightening. And then we got into a segregated bit, and you could breathe easily again. And so, uh, yes, and that's a very important point. I mean, I, the, the Boris Johnson years, they started with blue paint, mm. and it didn't, yes, work, didn't work, and it wasted a lot of time. Uh, and I really respect the way that they thought that's not working, they started again. Um, I, I don't want to criticise Kensington Council. Uh, you should try cycling down Kensington High Street at some point and ask yourself why in the richest borough in maybe in the world that high street is so horrendous. I, I don't understand it. 
It's four lanes of traffic. Who would vote for that in their shopping area? I don't know. And I, I don't know, I'm best baffled by it. Um, and that, again, that's a, a real, like, like Seven Dials, it's just a tell for me of at what point does that street get safe for cyclists because it's very dangerous right now, very dangerous. Um, it, it'll be really interesting to see if that ever changes. Apparently, they didn't even want blue paint there, so. Great. Well, <coughs> thank you very much indeed. That's very kind Thanks of you coming. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks for listening. We've just got a couple of more things to do to finish off the um, afternoon. It'll take a couple of seconds, actually. So, can we note the report and discussion, please? Brilliant. Okay, and can you delegate to me the authority in consultation with the Deputy Chair? and party group leads to agree the final report and cycling infrastructure. Agreed. 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 Then transport committee work programme, can we agree the work programme? Agreed. Agreed. And delegate authority to me in consultation with the deputy chair and party group leads to agree one, the submission to the GLA consultation on the draft London plan. Agreed. Agreed. And two, the submission to the Department of Transport's consultation on proposals for the creation of a major road network. Agreed. Thank you. Then finally, date of next meeting. 1st of uh, March 2018 at 10am in the Chamber. There is no other business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.